Hi students, I wanted to give you a kind of cheat sheet in terms of mechanical advantage and the direction of the input and output forces for the simple machines that we have been talking about. The first one is first class levers. In first class levers there are three different options based on where the fulcrum is in relationship to the load. Um, so if this is our uh, lever and our fulcrum is all the way over here and the load or the output is over there and the input is here. If the, if the fulcrum is so close to the load that means that the input force will be small and the distance will be long. Over here the distance will be short but the force will be great. So that gives it a mechanical advantage of greater than one. So I'm gonna write one plus. It'll be greater than one. Um, as you can see we put an input going down and the load goes up, so this changes direction. If we have a, uh, this would be an example like levering the rock out of the hole, right? Um, another first class lever, we have the fulcrum right in the middle. If the fulcrum's right in the middle of the input and the load, it will travel an equal distance down and an equal distance up so the force on either side will be equal which means that it has a mechanical advantage of one it's no greater than using your hands right so this would be like a scale whoops this would be like a scale I'm not sure what was going on there and as we can see it still changes the direction okay uh, the third type would be a fulcrum that is closer to the input than the load. Here we would move the input only a short distance which would mean a great force. The load would move a much greater distance which would mean a smaller force. Um, so that means that we are putting in a lot of force. So that means that this has a mechanical advantage of less than one. If you are having to input a great amount of force over a short distance, you're having to work, not in terms of force times distance, but in terms of you trying really hard, putting in a lot of force, you, um, that's going to be a lot of effort for you over here on the input side. Whereas the load moves a great deal, but it doesn't move with a lot of force. You're putting the force in. So the mechanical advantage is less than one. Uh, an example of this is rowing. As we can see, it still changes the direction. So first class levers always change the direction. However, in terms of the mechanical advantage, it can be more than one, one, or less than one. So that one would depend, okay? Um, oops, so now let's move this down a little bit. Let's go to second class levers. All right, with a second class lever, we have the fulcrum over here, we have the load here, and the input here. So meaning you would be picking it up right here and moving it in that direction, and the load would also be going in that direction, though a shorter distance. If this is going a shorter distance than the long distance that you're putting in here, so a long distance, small amount of force, short distance, great amount of force, that means that this will have a mechanical advantage of greater than one. This, as we can see, the both arrows are going up, so it does not change the direction. Uh, this would be an example of a wheelbarrow or a um, bottle opener or a paint can opener. You know, we talked about both of these examples in the last section. Um, so again, remember that any time that the distance that you are traveling through the input goes up, that means that the amount of force you have to expend goes down. If the load is traveling a short distance, that means that while it only moves a little bit, it moved with a lot of force, which is a good thing in terms of mechanical advantage. Uh, for a third class lever, I should say three, whoa, third class lever, um, you have your lever, you got your fulcrum, the input instead is over here, and your load is over here. Your load 
will travel a great distance. And if, it, if your load travels a great distance, that means it travels with a little force. As soon as it starts traveling with a little force, you know that your mechanical advantage is not great because your input will travel a short distance, but it's going to take a lot of effort or a lot of force. So this is minus one. It has less than one. This does not change the direction. Um, this, in this case, this would be like doing those uh, bicep curls that we were talking about or using a hammer. Hammer, bicep curls, okay. Um, so then after, uh, after levers, we can move on to pulleys. Like with levers, there's three different options. We've got fixed, um, we have block and tackle, block and tackle, and we also have the movable pulley. Movable. All right, so in your fixed pulley, uh, you know, it's going to be connected to the ceiling here. It's your pulley circle, uh, your pulley wheel your rope and it's connected to the load. You are going to pull down. So your input goes down. The output or the object moves up. So therefore we see it change the direction and this will have a mechanical advantage of one. It doesn't help you in terms of making it easier but it does change the direction. A movable pulley, you again will have you know, something connected to the ceiling there, but the rope will be tied off here. The rope comes down, and then you are standing up here. So the input force, and you pulling on it, will be moving in that direction. The pulley's here, attached to the object, and the object then moves up. Um, so this does not change the direction. However, it has a mechanical advantage of two, which again, if, if you remember block and tackle pulleys, there's two rope segments, so that kind of makes sense. Um, if we come over here to block and tackle, here's our connection. This is going to take me a second to draw. It's connected here. You've got pulley wheel connected to another pulley wheel. Then you've got a pulley wheel down here connected to another pulley wheel connected to your load. Then you've got your rope starts here, comes through here, comes up and around, comes down and around, comes all the way back up. Okay, so your input, input, you are going to be pulling it down. The box will then move up. So this does change the direction. There are one, two, three, four rope segments. So this will have a mechanical advantage of four, which really is just equal to the number of rope segments, um, which is usually equal to the number of pulleys. You'll be able to figure it out based on the number of pulleys because that's how many different pieces of rope will be moving through those pulleys. So in this case, the mechanical advantage of four. If there were six pulleys and six rope segments, it would be six. If there were eight pulleys and eight, eight ro rope segments, it would be eight. Um, so don't think that the answer is always four. It depends on the number of rope segments and pulleys. Moving on to wheel and axle. Wheel and, if I could spell this morning, wheel and axle. All right, um, so this would be like a doorknob or a faucet. Here we don't really need to worry about the direction from here on out because it doesn't make as much sense um, to talk about it in terms of, you know, when you're turning a doorknob, you don't really think about what direction you turn the doorknob and what direction the axle then turns. So there's your wheel 
and it's connected to some sort of axle. This would be, right here would be the actual doorknob, and inside here, that's the axle, that's the mechanism inside the door that turns as you turn the doorknob. So this does not change the direction. Doesn't change the direction, though so you don't really need to worry about that. To calculate the mechanical adva advantage, you take the radius of the wheel and divide it by the radius of the axle. Okay, so um, if this radius here was, um, let's say it was four, and this was two centimeters, you have four centimeters, two centimeters, it would be four divided by two, which would give us a mechanical advantage of two. Um, the reason for that is because you are turning this a much greater distance than you are turning this axle here. If you are moving over a great distance, that means your force is small. And if your force is small, that means we know that the mechanical advantage will be high. Um, if we come to an inclined plane, inclined plane wedges and screws all work very similarly. So incline plane. So we are, you know, this is the example of moving an object into the back of a pickup truck. We take the length and divide it by the height. We don't care about that length there. The reason we don't care about that length is because we're not actually moving the object along that length. We're moving it along a longer length here and then moving it up this height. So it'll be length divided by height to give us the mechanical advantage. So if this was eight and this was four, that would be eight divided by four. And once again, mechanical advantage of two. If we are talking about a wedge, so something like a knife or an axe or something like that. I know I tried to draw those on the board the other day. It didn't work very well. Um, if we're looking at the top view of an axe head or of a knife or something like that, we would take the thickness and the length. Again, we don't care really about this length here, right, because that one doesn't much matter. That's not the length that anything's actually in contact with. We're worried about this length or this one, which should be the same. So we would take the length and divide it by the thickness. So that's why when you're talking about knives, rather than having a short and blunt knife like that, Right? That would still hurt, fine, but it's not as long or as thin as this one is. So this knife has been crafted to be sharper, right? So if we're talking about sharpness, we're kind of talking about its mechanical advantage. That's why we use a steak knife rather than a butter knife to um, you know, eat steaks or any meat, really. Um, if we're looking at screws, the book does a good job of describing this, right? We've got our screw here. And if you, had, if you hadn't really thought about screws before, you've got those lines wrapping around the ends of the screw. If you took those off, it would look something like that, wrapped around the screw. And then if you straightened it out, it would be about that long. So once again, we're looking at the length to the thickness. because this is going to be very, very long, and clearly it's very thin. So since it's so thin and a great length, you're going to have a good mechanical advantage. It'll be much greater than one. If you had a very short, fat uh, screw, you wouldn't have as many wraps of this metal around here, and so the length to thickness ratio wouldn't be as great, and your mechanical advantage would be less than one. That's why you very rarely see screws that look like that. Um, hope this was helpful in getting you started in your reviewing for the upcoming quiz and the final. Um, remember that what we want to be focusing on is knowing some examples, right? We want to know three things. We want to know one, two, three. We want to know examples of each of the types of machines, and obviously in some cases like screws, it's pretty obvious, um, but we want to know, you know, what we would use a wheel and axle for, what we would use a first class lever for. Um, we want to know the mechanical advantage and we want to know um, the direction 
and whether or not the tool changes the direction. That does not apply for the last couple of wheel and axle, incline plane, wedge, and screw, but we, that does make sense for the first class, second class, third class levers, and then the pulleys. Um, this video should give you a good cheat sheet to help you get started with that.